Thank you. Um, I, I will try to speak kind of English. I'm not sure I will succeed, but um, yes, I have uh, also a f few memories of uh, the the early days for me of the Chevalier Seminar. I think the first time I attended the Chevalier Seminar was in uh, uh, 1978, and um, uh, I remember perfectly well my first talk there. Um, I don't know exactly the date, but it was in 78, and I do remember that it was probably a total disaster, uh, because in those days I imagined that uh, in a seminar talk you would have to uh, state uh, any result that you need, and to prove any result that you state, so it was uh, probably very boring, so I have to apologize to some of you who were there in those days. And um, uh, also I have some memories from uh, Chevalet himself. Um, I didn't know him very much, very well, but uh, I remember that um, he was very kind to beginners like I was in, in, in those days. And in particular, very often uh, asking questions where I'm sure he knew the answer. And uh, but it was very, very good for self-confidence that uh, Mr. Chevalet asked a question and you know the answer. You know, so it was very good. And uh, also very often it occurred in the uh, following situation. Um, imagine that during your talk you have a definition uh, depending on uh, an integer or a set or a group, and then you would hear a voice in the audience asking uh, what happens if uh, the integer is zero, or if the set is empty, or if the group is trivial. And um, it was not exactly a, 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 a naive question, because it's generally a very good exercise to try to see what these definitions uh, uh, mean in the case, in these um, very trivial cases. And um, so it was m some of the memories of Chevalet I had. Another link I would like to make uh, um, with uh, Chevalet and uh, is in the title of this talk because you see the word correspondence. And it goes back to the first uh, volume, the volume of set, set theory of uh, Bourbaki, where this notion is uh, introduced. And, um, of course, I have to uh, mention, it's my pleasure also to mention, that this is a joint work uh, with Jacques Thévenin. And um, we are, it's a work in progress, so there are still some things to, to be understood here. Okay, so let me uh, start with um, the talk. Uh, I will say a few words on uh, correspondence and uh, relations, in the sense, again, of Bourbaki. So here, uh, X and Y will be finite sets. Of course, this definition makes sense for arbitrary sets, but uh, in this talk, I will stick to finite ones. Uh, so what is uh, correspondence from X to uh, Y? Um, it's a subset of Y cross X. So here, there is a slight difference with uh, Bourbaki uh, definition, because in Bourbaki, a correspondence is not clearly oriented from one set to the other. It's a correspondence between two sets. And in the cases it seems to be oriented, it's rather a subset, it would be a subset of X cross Y. But we decided with Jacques to switch the, the terms for um, many practical reasons of composition. It's, it's much easier that way. Okay, in uh, the set of correspondences from uh, X to Y uh, is denoted by a C of Y and X. And uh, another definition, in the case of um, the equality, so if uh, y is equal to x, then we call a correspondence a relation. So it's a binary relation on the set x. 
Okay, one more feature uh, that uh, correspondences can be uh, composed in the following way. Suppose you have now three sets, x, y, and z, and a relation r from x to y, and another relation s from y to z, then you can compose them. And of, as usual, this composition is also denoted uh, simply by a product symbol. Then it's a set of pair uh, zx in the product z cross x, which are linked through uh, those two uh, relations. That is, there is an element y in y, for which zy is in s and yx is in r. So it's a composition of relation. This composition is associative. And uh, more than this, in the case uh, y is equal to x, we have a monoid of uh, relations on x um, because we have a unit uh, identity element consisting of the diagonal, uh, the set of pairs xx in the product x cross x. And uh, if you prefer, it's uh, also the equality relation on x. And more generally, it's also uh, yeah, an, an identity uh, element for um, arbitrary composition uh, from the left or from the right with any correspondence. So, of course, it gives um, the idea of building a category uh, where morphism would be these correspondences, and um, that's what we will do. But uh, as we like to, uh, well, we are used to work with uh, linear settings, so we will start by choosing a commutative ring and uh, linearize everything. So KC will be the following uh, category. The objects are uh, finite sets. Uh, the morphism in this category uh, are the correspondences from X to Y, but uh, actually we take the free K module on this set of correspondences. Okay, now we extend the composition just by uh, linearity from the composition of correspondences. And uh, once again, the um, identity of the object X is this uh, diagonal at X. Now we get a K linear category, or in maybe more pedantic terms, a category enriched over K modules. And we can consider uh, K linear functors from this category um, to uh, the category of K modules, and this is what we call uh, correspondence functors. So these correspondence functors uh, form uh, also the, are the object of a category where morphism are given by uh, natural transformations of functors. And as usual, as uh, for a category with values in uh, an abelian categories, then we get actually an abelian category. So this category FK is an abelian category. Okay, so maybe I should say a few words um, about our motivation. Uh, why why would, be, would, would we be interested in that? Um, actually, it comes from um, kind of, at some point we, we are working, we have worked a lot with uh, biset functor. So biset functor setting is um, in appearance very similar, so except that um, we are not working with sets but with finite groups and that uh, the correspondences are uh, replaced by, by sets. And um, this uh, theory has been successful in solving some, some important problem. So um, it, it was a very nice setting. But uh, there is one problem in this theory. Is, is that it's generally very hard to uh, compute explicitly uh, the simple uh, functors and the evaluations of the simple functors. We have description of them, but uh, from a combinatorial point of view, it's rather difficult to, uh, to, to solve this question. And um, so at some point, we, we, we got tired of working with groups, and uh, we decided to, to try to find something simpler. That is a setting that would keep the good part of uh, biset functors and avoid the bad part uh, I just uh, mentioned. And that's how uh, we came to that. So uh, maybe, probably it will, won't be enough uh, to you to, to, to see the interest of that, but uh, that's how we came to it. And um, right now, well, we find that it's 
certainly uh, uh, very natural uh, things to look at, so uh, that's all. But essentially it's for free uh, that we, we are working on, on that. We have no special application in mind so far. So, Okay, um, at least I would like to give you some examples of uh, these uh, correspondence functors. And a standard way to get examples of functors um, is to consider Yoneda functors. So you fix an object of the category that I denote by E, and uh, you look at the morphism from this object to an arbitrary uh, object X, and you get a functor, uh, which is called Yoneda functor because of the celebrated Yoneda lemma. And um, then you hear in the audience uh, the voice of Chevalet asking what happens if your set is empty. So you answer the question, what happens if um, E is empty? And then uh, you look at the correspondences from the empty set to an arbitrary set. And what is that? It's a subset of the product x cross the empty set, and the product x cross the empty set is itself empty, and there is only one subset of the empty set, which is the empty set itself. So it means that uh, this free module we are looking at is always free of rank one. In other words, uh, this Yoneda functor uh, takes the value k at any finite set. And it's easy to check that uh, the, if you have a correspondence from one finite set to another, then um, it acts on this k by the identity map. So very easy. Uh, next example, suppose now that E has a single point, it's a set with one element, so what happens? Again, what is the product of x with a set with one element? It's of course in bijection with x itself. So the set of uh, correspondence from the set with one element to x is also the set of subsets of x. And uh, that's why we uh, get um, the, the value of this functor, so it's a free module on the set of subsets of x. So these are two examples of such uh, functors. Uh, general uh, theory, that is essentially uh, Yoneda lemma in that case, say that this functor uh, this Yoneda functor at E is always a projective object in this category. So we get a bunch of uh, projective uh, objects in this way. One may ask now, well, are these projective objects indecomposable? Um, and uh, if not, what are the direct summons of these guys? So uh, to find direct summons, um, standard procedure is to look at the endomorphism of these functors. And again, by Yoneda lemma, the endomorphism of this functor are given by um, the uh, algebra of relations, that is, uh, C of EE e is a monoid, as I said at first. And so there is an algebra of OK of this monoid. And if you can find uh, some idempotence in this uh, algebra, then we find some direct summons of this Yoneda functor. And there is a very um, simple way to find some idempotence, is to look at preorders on E. Because um, what is a preorder, in maybe not traditional terms, it's a relation on E which contains uh, the diagonal and which is equal to its square. So the fact that it contains a diagonal um, means that it is reflexive as a relation. And then, what that? <laughs> and then the fact that it, um, it contains its square means that it is uh, transitive. And if you have both this condition, actually it is equal to its square. And now um, we get an idempotent in this uh, endomorphism ring, and we can uh, split uh, the Yoneda functor uh, using this idempotent. We get another projective object in this category, Fk. OK, uh, so these two uh, examples are actually part of a more general setting uh, that we'll, I will now introduce. Um, there, are, there is a, a huge class of functors which are associated to uh, lattices. And it goes uh, as follows. For first, I will recall uh, what a lattice is. So I will always consider finite lattices here. So it's a poset. 
uh, with uh, so another relation, and uh, the condition is that uh, any pair of elements uh, in uh, T has a lowest upper bound that is denoted with this uh, joint symbol and a greatest lower bound. So you have this element and it means that any element which is bigger than both x and y is also bigger than this one and similarly the other the way around for the meet symbol. So this is a lattice and in particular as it is finite um, in a lattice, in general, any finite subset has uh, lowest, uh, the largest uh, lower bound. And so the, it means that there is a smallest element in T somewhere. We'll denote that way. And there is a top element, which is just... Uh, uh, so the, the zero is um, the meat of all the elements of the lattice. Okay. Uh, now, if we have such a uh, lattice and a finite set x, we can define something we call f sub t of x as the free module on the set of maps from x to t, that I denote by t to the x. And, uh, well, it defines something on the object of the category. Now, I want to build a functor, so uh, I have to say what the action of a map and uh, the action of a correspondence from x to y on a function uh, from x to t will be a function uh, from um, y to t that we define in the following way. So this function r phi evaluated at an element y is the join over all element x such that yx is in the correspondence r of the value of phi at x. And now uh, there is a theorem. First of all, uh, Ft is a correspondence functor. That is, we have uh, other examples of such functors. And one may ask, uh, when is this Ft a projective object? And there is a very nice characterization of this projectivity. It occurs if and only if uh, the lattice T is distributive. So distributive means uh, that um, one of these, so you have this T with these two lows, and uh, one of these low is distributive uh, with respect to the other. These two conditions are really equivalent in a lattice. So we have this characterization of a distributive lattices as projective object in some abelian category, which is quite interesting. Uh, we'd like to go a little bit further, that is, uh, now consider the assignment that send a lattice to this functor Ft, and we would like to make a functor from that. So it means that we have to introduce some category of lattices, and this is uh, what I'll do now. So let T be the following uh, category. Uh, the object of T are the finite uh, lattices. And a morphism, sorry, a morphism in this category is a map. Uh, so morphism from T to T prime is a map from T to T prime, which is compatible with uh, arbitrary joins. That is, the image of a join is the join of the images. You should be aware here that it doesn't mean that this map is uh, a map of lattices in the obvious sense of the term, that is, it doesn't mean this map has to respect the meet operation. Anyway, this is what we want. In particular, um, one may ask uh, what happens if A is empty, again. So what is the join over an empty set? It is a zero element of the lattice. And it means, in particular, that this map has to respect the uh, zero element, map, it, map zero to zero. Okay, um, once again, we prefer to work in a linear setting, so we linearize everything, so introduce k at various places, get a category kt, and the objects are the same, except that now the morphism are the free module uh, over the previous set of morphisms. And composition, again, is obtained by 
uh, linear extension of uh, composition of maps here. Uh, that's our category, and uh, we have the following uh, theorem. Uh, first of all, uh, this assignment sending a lattice to the corresponding functor is now indeed a functor from this category kt to uh, fk. Not only it's a functor, but it's also k-linear. And uh, most important, not only it's a k-linear functor, but it's also fully faithful which means that um, we have represented this category of lattices inside this abelian uh, category as a fully uh, faithful uh, subcategory. Okay, now we have got some, um, a bunch of projective uh, objects in this uh, category of correspondence functors. It is an abelian category, so one may ask uh, what happens with uh, simple functors. So about simple functors, uh, this is what uh, we can uh, generally say. We let S be a simple functor in uh, this category. Um, and uh, the possibility, the additional uh, feature we have uh, in the uh, category of finite set is that we have the notion of size of a set, that is the cardinality. And uh, when we have a simple functor, well, first I should say what this means. It means that um, this S has exactly two subobjects, the zero subobject and itself, and no uh, other subobject. And um, it means that there is some set where it does not vanish. So I choose a minimal one for which S is non-zero, and it's always possible. And then by standard um, category theory, uh, the evaluation of S at E is a module for the algebra of endomorphism of E, which is the algebra of this monoid of relations. But as we have chosen E to be minimal, it means that every endomorphism of E, which factors through a strictly smaller set, will act by zero, because uh, on S, um, the action will factorize through um, a, a, a zero value, so it is zero. So actually, this S of E is a module for this quotient algebra, uh, where we factor out the ideal uh, that is generated by all morphism, which factor through a strictly smaller set. This is a two-sided ideal. ideal, this is quite obvious. And um, we know, with Jacques, we know very well this algebra because in a previous work we have studied the, the representations of this uh, algebra. And we call this algebra the algebra of essential relations on E, or the essential algebra of E. And in particular, uh, we could determine all the simple modules for this um, algebra. I'll be back on that later in Cipontot because in this uh, setting, um, this S of E is actually a simple module for uh, this algebra. And it's also very important because we have a converse of that. That is, suppose uh, we are given now a finite set and a simple module for this um, algebra. Then there is a unique uh, simple functor, S, indexed by E and V up to isomorphism, of course, for which uh, E is minimal and for which the evaluation of S at V is isomorphic to the given module. So it gives a one-to-one -one correspondence, like this, between simple functors and pairs consisting of a finite set and a simple module for this uh, essential mm -hmm. algebra. Okay, so let me say a little more about these simple modules for this uh, essential algebra. E is a finite set. Now there is a bijection of, between the simple module for this essential algebra and pairs consisting, pairs RW consisting of a partial order R on E and a simple module for the algebra of the group of automorphism of this order. So this is what we proved uh, with Jacques in a um, previous work. 
And if you uh, believe uh, uh, these uh, three points in this uh, slide, then you uh, come to the following theorem. There is a bijection between the simple correspondence functors over k up to isomorphism and triples consisting of a finite set, E, an order relation on E, and a simple module for the group of automorphism of this order. And of course, as we have uh, a nice parametrization, we, we will use it. And uh, if we have such a triple, we will denote the corresponding simple functor by S sub ERW. OK, do we have examples of such simple functors? Well, let me uh, come back to the uh, Yoneda functor. Uh, here I will assume that K is a field. Um, and uh, we have this uh, Yoneda functor um, indexed by the empty set. So remember, this functor takes a value k everywhere. So it probably has a good chance to be a simple functor, and it is. Uh, more than this, um, we have seen that uh, as it is a Yoneda functor, it's always projective. And since we are working now over a field, there is a duality argument. Uh, which shows that this functor is also injective in that case. So it is a very nice object in this category. And uh, one may ask, so what is a triple parametrizing this uh, simple functor? And it goes as follows. It's parametrized by the empty set. Uh, what I did not by thought is a total order on the empty set. And k is a trivial module for the group of automorphism of this order. So if you think a little bit of that, to answer uh, Chevalet's question again, uh, there is only one order on the empty set. It is a total order, because a condition expressing a total order is just void, so it's true. And uh, now, of course, the automorphism group of this order is a trivial group, and there is only one simple module for the trivial group, which is k. So everything is trivial here. OK, maybe more uh, interesting, the next one. So this Yoneda functor for the set with one element. Uh, this one is not simple, but almost. It is semi-simple and also projective and injective. And um, how does it split uh, as a sum of simple? Well, it splits as uh, the sum of the previous one indexed by the empty set, and a simple indexed by the following triple, a set with one element, a total order on it, and a trivial module. So again, if you have a set with one element, you have only one possible order on that set, and this is a total order. So the group of automorphism of this order is also trivial, and there is only one simple module, the trivial module. So this is how it works. To go uh, a little bit further in the study of simple functors, I will uh, need another tool um, that will be a sub-functor of uh, this functor Ft that we can define in general. And for this, I will need the notion of uh, irreducible uh, element in a lattice. So in a finite, here the lattice is finite, but uh, this definition makes sense in an arbitrary lattice, of course. An element is called irreducible if, uh, whenever you can write this element as a join of a subset, actually it belongs to this subset. Well, it may not be the usual definition uh, you saw. Usually one says, well, an element is irreducible if you, whenever you can write it as a join of two elements, then it's equal to one of them. But I prefer that this is definition because um, it also works in the case A is empty again. So it means that the zero element is never irreducible in a lattice because it, that, there is no element in the empty set. So, OK, so that's the notion of uh, irreducible. Uh, notation, the set of uh, irreducible element is denoted by this uh, E of t. Um, now, for a finite set x, remember we have uh, this functor uh, ft evaluated at x, and we'll define a submodule of this ft of x. So ft of x was a free module on the set of functions from x to t, 
and we'll consider the submodule generated by all the functions um, with the property that the image of this function does not contain the whole of the irreducible elements. So it's just a definition. And uh, now we have a lemma. Um, suppose we have two finite sets. We have a correspondence from uh, x to y, so it's finite sets x and y. And we have a function from x to t. And we look at the set of elements in the image of the map r phi, which are irreducible. Then this set is contained in the corresponding set for uh, the map phi, the set of elements in the image of phi, which are irreducible. And as a consequence, uh, this assignment sending x to jt of x is a subfunctor of ft. So it's one of the things I learned uh, at the Chevalet Seminar is that you definitely should not state anything you need and should not prove anything you state, but it's also generally a good idea to give at least one proof during a talk. So this is, uh, I decided to, to give you the proof of this lemma in the small uh, blank space at the bottom of this slide because it's, it's quite uh, easy. So proof of that, suppose we have such a correspondence from x to y, you have a function from x to t, and we have an element, uh, an irreducible element in the, map, in the image of the map R phi. So it means that this element can be written as um, R phi of y for some element y in capital Y. In other words, going back to the definition, it is a join over all element x for which y x is in R of phi of x. And now um, you go back to the top of the slide, you see the definition of irreducible element, and you look at what we have down, and um, you understand that the consequence is that there is some element x such that y x is in R, and E is equal to phi of x. So E belongs to the right-hand side of the inclusion, and we are done. And obviously now the second assertion follows, because um, if uh, the set on the right is a proper subset of E of T, then the set on the left is also a proper subset. So we get a nice uh, subfunctor of this uh, FT. And uh, why uh, is this subfunctor good for? Well, uh, there is a very nice situation, the case of a total order that I will now uh, explain. For this, I'll choose uh, an integer. Uh, for me, um, it includes uh, the possibility that n be zero. I denote by n underline um, the partially ordered set, actually totally ordered set of integers from zero to n. Uh, it's easy to check that this is a lattice. Um, it's the, the, so the, the join operation is just the maximum of a pair, and the, the meet operation is the minimum of a pair. More than this, it is a distributive lattice. So the corresponding functor we will get, uh, f sub n underline, will be a projective object. Um, what is uh, the set of irreducible elements in this uh, lattice? Well, it's just a set I denote by n bracket, uh, which is just n underline minus zero. Remember that the zero of a lattice is never irreducible. So it's exactly the set of uh, irreducible elements in this uh, lattice. Then, then we have the following uh, theorem. Uh, we denote by S of n underline the quotient of F sub n underline by J sub n underline. So the corresponding two functors are introduced for an arbitrary uh, lattice. Here I apply th this construction to n underline. Then uh, what happens is that uh, this suggestion um, from f of n to uh, s of n splits. In other words, s of n is a direct summand of f of n, and in particular, it is projective. Now, if we want to evaluate this s of n uh, on a finite set, uh, what do we do? Uh, it's a quotient of f n by j n. f n is as a basis consisting of all the maps from x to t, and jn as um, basis consisting of all the maps from x to t 
which do not contain the irreducible, that is, um, this set N bracket. So the quotient as a basis consisting of all the maps from X to T, uh, whose image contains N bracket. And um, in proof, this is a free K module. And more than this, um, an easy computation shows that um, the rank of this module is given by this alternating sum. Um, you, you can see on the, on the board here. Very good. Now, um, this functor S of N are uh, interesting because um, they also give a decomposition of this functor F sub N underline. So it splits as um, the direct sum over all subsets of N bracket of the corresponding functor of size, uh, the size of the subset. In other words, it's also isomorphic to the direct sum uh, from, for J running from 0 to N of N choose J copies of this S of J. Uh, now, uh, what is the consequence of that? The consequence is that the endomorphism uh, of this lattice in the category KT, remember we have uh, this fully faithful functor from KT to FK, so it's also isomorphic to the endomorphism of this functor Fn in the category Fk. And this actually splits as a product of matrix algebras uh, over K um, of size n choose j. And uh, well, at first I never heard of such kind of decomposition and I th have to thank uh, Yvon Marin for pointing me to uh, some literature on that. And uh, if you want to, to know more about this, you, you, you should uh, search for uh, the expression uh, planar Rook algebra. So it's, it's something, there are lots of literature on that. And um, this algebra actually has been uh, uh, considered in the literature. Okay. And uh, well, finally, um, this is what I want to, to to come. Uh, when k is a field, then probably you guess what I mean. This functor S of n is simple. It's also projective and injective. And uh, what is a triple indexing this functor? Well, this triple is just uh, the set n bracket, a total order on that, and uh, the trivial module. So again, the automorphism, um, the group of automorphism of a total order is always trivial, so there is a single uh, simple module, and uh, so that's the correspondence. So we have a very nice description of this simple functor in the case we know everything, it has very nice properties, in the case of a total order. Um, we will see that the general situation is a bit more uh, complicated, but uh, I will try to explain that uh, nevertheless. So let me now consider an arbitrary finite post set, so a set E with an order relation, partial order relation on it. Uh, we'll need a bunch of uh, notation. First, I will choose a finite lattice such that um, this uh, post set appears as the um, post set of irreducible elements in T as a full poset. So full means in the sense of full subcategories here. It's exac exactly that. And um, so I choose that one in this, uh, like this. I will tell you how this is possible. And I also want an additional property is that the automorphism of T are isomorphic to the automorphism of R. So what happens here, we have this T we, has, we have this uh, ER, which is the full subset of irreducible element. Then, obviously, there is a morphism from the automorphism of T to the automorphism of ER, just given by restriction. If we have an automorphism of T, obviously, it maps an irreducible element to another one. So we have a group of auto, uh, homomorphism like this. It is always injective because any element of T is a join of irreducible elements. So if an automorphism uh, fixes every irreducible, it will just fix any element of the lattice. But there are cases where this inclusion here is proper. 
and I don't want that. I want uh, these two to be isomorphic. And fortunately, we can choose uh, such a lattice. For example, uh, we can take for T the lattice of uh, what is called the lower ideals of um, the post set ER, that is a set of subsets of E which are closed downward for the uh, order relation. And uh, it is a lattice, actually it is even a distributive lattice for the union and intersection of subsets. So it's a possibility um, to take this one. It's not the only possibility, there are other ones. And um, anyway, so it's possible to do that. Next, I need a bunch of notations, so maybe I'll, I'll go quickly on that. Uh, if E is an element of E and we have such a lattice, then I've, I can view E as an irreducible element of the lattice. And it means that E cannot be written as a join of uh, proper, uh, strictly smaller elements. So it means there is a unique maximal element uh, which is strictly smaller than E and I denote it by R of E. Now, um, suppose we have a subset of E, subset A of E, uh, define a map from E to T in the following way. An element E is mapped to itself if it is not in A, and it is mapped to this R of E if it is in A. Next uh, notation, take the alternating sum of all these uh, maps, uh, indexed by subsets of E, then this, is, uh, this belongs to uh, the free module of, uh, with basis a set of functions from E to T. Of course, I could view uh, this uh, set of, um, this free module as the value of Ft of E, but I choose to, to do it differently. Uh, it's the value of Ft opposite of E. So what is T opposite? The opposite is the opposite lattice, uh, where you take the opposite uh, order relation, or uh, equivalently, you switch those two operations. And you get, again, a lattice, and uh, this is uh, what uh, is denoted by T up here. And finally, um, I consider the sub-functor of this functor ft op generated by this element gamma. That is, the value at x of such a functor is obtained in, the, in this way. You take gamma, you take any correspondence from E to your set, and you, you take the image of gamma uh, in this functor, and you take uh, the linear combination of all these guys. So it's a bit complicated. Anyway, there is this uh, notation like this, and we have now the uh, following uh, theorem. First of all, that this S of ER does not depend on the choice of T with the two above properties. So it does not depend on that, which is good. Now, there exists an integer, uh, non-zero non uh, natural uh, integer, which depends on only on the, the post set ER, with the following property, uh, for any finite x, uh, this module SER of x is a free module of rank given by this um, alternating sum. So it's exactly the same as before, except that the one we had uh, in the, between the uh, parentheses is replaced by this f we have here. But apart from that, it's exactly the same. More than this, this evaluation of uh, this functor at x has also a structure of a right module for the group of automorphism uh, of the order. Now, uh, what can we do if we take a, an arbitrary module for the group of automorphism of ER, then we can tensor uh, this module, this right module with the left module over the group of automorphism. We get an assignment uh, sending x to this k module, and uh, as you probably guess, this is also a correspondence functor that we denote by S of ERW. 
And now, uh, probably you also guess what I want to say next. When k is a field and this module w is simple, then actually the functor we get that way is precisely the simple functor s e r w. Okay, um, I won't prove this theorem because it's very hard to prove. And especially the, the point number two here is uh, took us, well, we had the guess of what would possibly happen, uh, I think, almost two years ago now. Um, finally, we came to a conjecture um, at the beginning of this year. And um, I'm sure that, uh, so finally this conjecture was proven uh, at the end of June or beginning of July, I don't remember exactly. And in between, uh, it occurs at least 15 times that we were sure to have a proof. And uh, the next day we found a mistake in the proof. <laughs> so it was, it was really, really difficult. So anyway, I will try to give a sketch of, uh, a sketch of, sketch of proof because it's, it's very, uh, very, very fast, as you see. Um, first of all, there is a non-degenerate functorial bilinear pairing um, like this. So what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, for any set, for any finite set, there is a bilinear map like this. And uh, this is functorial in the following sense. If you have a correspondence, a function, and a function, then this is equal to phi s opposite psi. So this is what I mean. And it's non-degenerate in a very strong sense. That is, it induces an uh, isomorphism between uh, the dual of that and the k-dual of ft of x and ft op of x. So these two functors are actually isomorphic. Even if k is not the field. You can take the integers, if you like, and it works. Now, uh, there is uh, always a surjective map going from this quotient of ft over jt to this s e of r opposite. You have to switch the, the, the relation here. Um, what we could prove, and what was really the hot point in it, is that there is a set, g, a subset of t, uh, which is an explicit, we, can, we know how to build this subset explicitly. It is invariant by the group of automorphism of uh, e r. It also contains the set E of irreducible of T with the following property for any finite set X, if we consider the set of functions from X to T such that the image is in sandwich between E and this set G, and we take the image of that in the quotient S E R up evaluated at X, then we get a basis, a K basis of this module. And um, finally, what the, um, the, the, the last step is just to set uh, this integer f that showed up in the statement of the theorem is just uh, the cardinality of the difference between uh, the cardinality of g and the cardinality of e. So it's a very strange invariant of a finite post set that I so uh, apparently did, did not appear so far uh, in, in the literature. Maybe some of you uh, have heard about this, but uh, so in that case, you are welcome to, 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 tell, you, to tell us what, we, what you know. Um, okay, so uh, as a corollary, uh, it's almost obvious from what uh, I said before. Suppose we have a field characteristic zero now. Um, and we want to uh, evaluate uh, the simple functor attached to a finite poset and um, a simple module for the group of automorphism. Then uh, we would like to know the dimension of the evaluation of the corresponding simple functor. Then it's given by the following formula. This dimension is equal to the same, um, it's written differently here, but uh, the same sum we had, so the, before, this alternating sum, 
and in front of it you have the dimension of the module divided by the order of the group. So this is, from what we did, this is quite easy to prove. Okay, um, what should I say next? T does not appear, precisely, because I said that this functor does not depend on T. It's one on the result. So you choose a T with these two properties, and then you can forget about it. But, um, yeah, 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 yeah. There are several possibilities, and of course, for computational uh, properties, if you want to compute with gap, for example, this kind of stuff, um, generally you have to take the smallest possible t, and we showed actually that there is a smallest uh, canonical uh, such t uh, with these properties. Okay, um, so yes, one more thing I would like to uh, say, it's a very recent, I uh, observed that last week, so it's called splitting the diamond, and um, it's not, has nothing to do with <laughs> with real diamonds, but what is a diamond in uh, this setting of lattices? It's uh, the following lattice, and uh, maybe you guess what, why it's called diamond. And this guy is important because it is the smallest non-distributive lattice. I leave that as an exercise to you. Uh, I don't know if, yes, what can see that. So yeah, you have the top element, the bottom element, and the three remaining uh, elements are uh, irreducible, so they are in blue here. And it turns out that um, if you have a field which, is, uh, uh, which has characteristic different from two, then the corresponding functor is semi-simple. And uh, how does it split? Um, well, you have a sum starting with S0, 4, S1, 4, S2, and S3. So what do I mean? Um, S sub n here is uh, the simple functor corresponding to a set of size n, totally order, and a trivial module. So it's a short for the previous notation. And so you have this uh, direct sum here. <coughs> You have next uh, two copies of this functor. So this functor is the functor S, maybe I should write it here. So this S with two dots like this is just what I denoted S E R, or maybe uh, um, before, so uh, where E is a set of cardinality two. So this set E. You take the equality relation on that. Uh, then what is the automorphism group of the equality relation? It's obviously a group of order two. You can switch the points. So there are two simple modules over a field of characteristic different from two. That's the reason why it shows up here. And um, this functor actually splits as a sum of two, these two simple functors in that case. And this is what I wrote here. And finally, there is an additional term uh, which corresponds to these uh, dots in blue here. So you have this sub functor corresponding to this pose set. This pose set has only trivial uh, automorphism again. So uh, this uh, functor denotes a simple functor indexed by this pose set, uh, the, the only possible order, which is uh, this one, and the only possible simple module, which is the trivial one. Okay, um, one more uh, result. Um, I told you that uh, this uh, integer f uh, associated to a post set is explicit. We can compute it, so I would like to uh, show you how this can be done for all post sets of cardinality 4. So there are 16 post sets of cardinality 4. Um, and it goes like this. First of all, we have um, the total order on a set of uh, cardinality uh, 4, and this one has f equal to 1. Uh, actually, uh, in general, this is a general result that uh, f equals 1 only occurs for the case of a total order. Okay, we have uh, 14 other ones, which are uh, drawn like this, for which f is equal to 2. And there is one missing, maybe you can guess which one it is. This one, which has f equal to 3. 
and uh, well, uh, we have similar computation for both sets of size five and six and so on. Um, the problem here is that uh, the number of post sets of a given size uh, grows very, very fast. And uh, one uh, number I remember because it's quite easy uh, on a set of size eight, there are 16 hundred and uh, no there are 16 so I will write it down because <laughs> so for n equals to 8 there are this number of post sets uh, on, on a set of side 8 actually it's I, I discovered that this was uh, already known uh, to uh, Birkhoff there's a famous book of Birkhoff on lattices, and he knew uh, how many post sets there was. I don't know, I would still wonder how he computed that, but, um, because it's, it's really not easy. And uh, probably, uh, I think Götz Pfeiffer uh, knows much more than, than I do on, on that. I know he wrote a paper and some algorithm to, to find this number. It's really hard to compute in general. Okay, so uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> there is a question. <laughs> ah, uh, the diamond functor. Well, what happens is that, uh, uh, as you saw, there is this small piece here, uh, which is no longer semi-simple, because there is only one simple module, and uh, so you, you have uh, some simply a similar decomposition as the group algebra you, you can have for a group of order two in characteristic two. So. It's not a big deal, but not the point. So at the beginning, if you compose correspondences by uh, uh, counting multiplicity, since you, you linearize anyway, you could put multiplicity, and uh, that's what geometers, uh, algebraic geometers would do. So is there anything remaining of the story? Or is it, anyway, I, does I, it, it's not what you want? Uh, we, you di we didn't look at it. OK. No. Um, did you look at the infinite case? <laughs> so I mean, uh, obviously not uh, an arbitrary lattice, but let's say a uh, well-ordering. Oh yes, I looked a little bit at that. Uh, actually, we are currently writing uh, writing this, and, uh, and so at some point, so we shared the work. <laughs> There's lots of, of writing to do, and I at some point I started writing this section on this functor of t. And um, at first I said, well, it's useless to have a finiteness assumption. Uh, but very fast it, it, it started being uh, quite awful. So uh, finally I gave up and I wrote this section uh, with the assumption that it's finite. But the definition of FT makes sense, of course, for an arbitrary uh, lattice. The point is that uh, you no longer have this equivalence between the projectivity of FT and the distributivity of the lattice. This fails. Uh, if you have an infinite one, it doesn't work anymore. And uh, so that's also why I stick to, 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 to finite ones at the end. is a projective functor thank you uh, so uh, so that means that actually every from a cohomological point of view every functor is acyclic because the constant functor gives if, you the limit if you, functor. if you compute the x from the constant functor to yeah to so w w would you get any any consequences about say these algebras that you get being hereditary or something like that in this direction uh, I have no idea, no idea. I didn't well, we didn't look at that so far, but... Uh. Thank you. No other question? So we thank... Uh, <coughs> uh, another question? Pierre? 
it's not a question, it's a comment, is that what you call irreducible correspond more or less, if I understand correctly, to indecomposable module or representation. Uh, it, uh, the irreducible elements in a lattice, yes, you yes. mean? This is standard terminology in, yes, in, no, but in, in I combinatorics. Mean, to me, the analogy is uh, with indecompos. I mean, if I look at the results and the patterns, uh -huh. it's uh, more or less the same as. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's it reminds you of indecomposable. The distinction between simple projective yeah, but and it's, it's, it's also it also looks at uh, the notion of uh, irreducible subset of a topological space, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. no so.